to prayers for which no one ever bothered to ask. So what that means, that what Billy Graham is saying is, we have not because we ask not. And uh, almost, although most Christians believe in praying about important decisions, we often make uh, our decisions without prayer. Uh, there's several reasons for that. And one, maybe they question whether the particular decision they're facing requires prayer. They don't have time to pray because a decision is needed immediately. They don't know what to ask for, or they don't really believe that God will give them an answer. So there's many, and there's I'm sure more than that, reasons why we don't always pray about decisions that we make. But we're going to be studying this morning in Luke chapter 11. And when we, uh, verses 1 through 13, and then after studying Luke 1 through 13, we'll turn over to chapter 18, still of Luke, verses 1 through 8. But we'll begin with Luke 11, 1 through 13. Verse number 1 of chapter 11 says, Once when Jesus had been out praying, one of his disciples came to him, as he finished and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. The disciples had watched Jesus' prayer life. And just going through the book of Luke, not looking anywhere except in the book that we're studying today, we find in Luke, and, and I'm sure there are others, but I've listed several times when I saw that Jesus prayed in the book of Luke, and he prayed. He seemed to pray, and I'm sure he did pray, at every major crisis point in his life. You know what? Jesus is God. And he prayed because he was in a human body, my friends. And he was setting an example for us. He was showing us what we need to do as believers. He prayed at his baptism in chapter 3. When the time came to choose his disciples in chapter 6, he prayed. He prayed when he was alone in chapter 5 and chapter 9. He prayed with others around in chapter 9. He prayed for Simon in chapter 22. He prayed in the Garden of, e e or the Garden of Gethsemane before his betrayal in chapter 22. And he even prayed on the cross. Remember what he said on the cross? Father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So one of his disciples doesn't say which one, but one of his disciples was very impressed with the prayer life of Jesus. So he asked here in verse 1, uh, teach us how to pray. So as Jesus always does when he has a faithful question asked, he answers it. Of course doesn't say that. I'm paraphrasing. But yes, I will teach you to pray. In verse number two, he said, this is how you should pray. Now we're going to, it's the model prayer in Luke. You are used to a slightly longer version of it that we repeat, you know, in, in times past, we would go a lot of places, school functions and all kinds of things, where the whole, um, crowd would recite the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's the model prayer, but if you want to find the true Lord's Prayer, read John chapter 17. That's the Lord's Prayer. But he gave a model prayer here. So he told that when he began this prayer, okay, I'll teach you how to pray. The first word out of his mouth was Father. Okay. You and I are not surprised. We use that term all the time, don't we? We we know that God is our Father. We refer to Him as our Father. But do you know in the Old Testament, which uh, took place before this was written, that Jesus was He was referred to as our God uh, wasn't referred to as Father. He was referred to most often as. Um, Jehovah, or Lord. He had a lot of names, Jehovah Jireh. He had a lot of names in the Old Testament, but I believe only once, if I remember right, is there a reference to him being Father. 
So you and I don't think anything about that, but when he said that, I, it set those disciples back on their heels. Now they could understand Jesus saying, Father, but he said, this is how you should pray to the disciples. And he began that prayer with the word, Father. I think it surprised the disciples a lot. They'd never, that I see in scripture, been instructed to do that before. Or even been told that they could. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be honored. That word honored means treated as holy. Christians, let me say to you today, the name of God should always be honored. The name of God should always be treated as holy. And we're living in a day and age where we see God's name slung all over everything and there's nothing holy about it. Why, they even have a little letter thing, OMJ. OMG. <laughs> you can tell I don't use it. OMG. You, you know what it means, don't you? Yeah, it means oh my God. As a slang phrase. Let me tell you something. If you're on Facebook or you're a Christian on anything, OMG should not be in your vocabulary. I said that one time and somebody said to me, well, what I mean is oh my goodness. Well, you may have meant oh my goodness, but that's not what I read. And that's not what the people who read it read. So if, if you mean something else, you need to write it out. Because if you just put OMG, we're all reading it. No matter what you meant it to be, we're reading it. Oh, my God. And it's slinging God's name around with no holiness at all attached to it. I went swimming today. Oh, my God. I had a great meal. Oh, my God. Really? You hear it on... TV constantly. Listen, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be honored. So if you have, and many Christians do have a habit of, of using God's name in vain, and it's nothing but a bad habit, you need to stop. Because Jesus said, it's in red letters, so Jesus said it, we need to pay particular attention to what he tells us. He said, this is how you should pray. May your name be honored. May your name be treated as holy. If you use God's name, you need to either be talking to him or about him. And if you're not talking to him or about him, don't pepper your conversation with his name because it's not treating it as holy. May your kingdom come soon. Has God's, has God's kingdom come yet? No. It's going to come at the rapture, after the, the rapture and after the uh, tribulation. Then the kingdom of God is coming. But he said you should look forward to the kingdom of God coming. May your kingdom come soon. Give us our food day by day. Pray about your daily needs. You know, food sustains life. That It may need to be prayed over. Winning the lottery does not. So it doesn't fall in that same category of your needs. It doesn't say pray every day. He didn't say pray every day for your wants. He said pray every day for your needs. Those things that you need to live a holy life. Those things that you need to sustain life itself. Pray about those things. And forgive us our sins. We, folks, every day, you and I are sinners. And I think the most dangerous person and the most dangerous Christian is the one that says, well, I sin every now and then, but not very often. Oh, no. You sin all the time, and so do I. And he thought, word, and deed, we're sinners. And we sin. And every day we need to seek the forgiveness for our sins. Jesus paid a price so that we, he died on the cross so that you and I could say, Father, forgive me of my sins and the blood of Jesus Christ takes away all 
of sin. This part used to scare me. You know, every time we pray this in a public place, you know, at the school functions or at wherever, we used to do it pretty often, you hardly ever do it anymore. But back when we would pray it, I, I would come to this part and it would say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And every time I would pray that, I would scan through my mind, is there anybody I haven't forgiven? But I, it's because it scared me to say, forgive me as I forgive. You know, because I'm not always, I wasn't always that forgiving. I didn't want to be forgiven as I forgave. I wanted to be forgiven better and more than that. Okay, but I think what this actually is saying, forgive us of our sins. We need to pray for personal forgiveness of sin. Just as we forgive those who have sinned against us. We need to remember that because we have been forgiven, we should forgive. When I think and when you think of everything that God has forgiven you of, oh, just think back over your whole life. All of those sins every day piling up and God has forgiven us of those sins through the blood of, and because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when I think about all the sins that God has forgiven me of, my friend, I, whatever you've done to me, it should be easy for me to forgive you. And no matter what somebody has done for you, when you think about all the sins in your life, that God has forgiven you of, my friend, whatever anybody has done to you, forgiveness in the light of how you've been forgiven should come easier. He's just reminding us, remember of all your sins that you were forgiven of. Remember everything the blood of Jesus Christ took out of your life because the Bible says that when the the blood of Jesus Christ takes away all sin. And then you know what God says about it. He takes our sin and casts it in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Casts it in the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, and he'll never remember it again. Have we been forgiven of a lot? Yes, and God's not going to bring it up to us again. You say, well, we face judgment. Yes, we will, but not for sin. Because the blood of Jesus Christ took away our sin, and God promised he'd never mention it again. He said he'd forget it, not because he has a bad memory, but because he chose, chooses to forget it because he doesn't hold us guilty anymore because our sin has been taken away. So because we have been forgiven and, and God said, I not only forgive your sin, hey, it's gone. So if your sin is gone, let me just say this, if your sin is gone, and you must believe it is, don't you? Isn't that what it says? The blood of Jesus Christ takes away all sin. It's gone. God says, I'll cast it in the sea of my forgetfulness because I don't want to remember it anymore. Because the blood of Jesus Christ took it away. So, if our sin is gone, can I ask you a question? Why do we continue to beat ourselves up with guilt? We beat ourselves up with guilt over a sin that's gone. And that God chooses not ever to remember again. Oh yes, we'll face judgment, but it'll be uh, according to all the parables about it, it will be what we did with what we had. Stewardship. And don't let us yield to temptation. Now that sounds kind of odd, you know, in the King James it says, lead us not into temptation. And what it means is lead us around it, lead us over it, but but lead us so that we don't go through temptation. Lead us away from it. In other words, help me to live a righteous life. Now we're going to go into a parable now, beginning with chapter uh, 5. And a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay, uh, and a good lesson as in this parable, a good lesson can be taught by a bad example. Let's, let's read it. Verse number five. Then teaching them more about prayer, he's still teaching them about prayer. This parable is about prayer. He said, now teaching them more about prayer, 
he used this illustration or this parable. He said, suppose you went to a friend's house. Now, this is your friend, not just your neighbor. I mean, hopefully your neighbors are your friend, but this is a friend, not just a person at random, but a friend. He said, you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, you would say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. His friend got there at midnight. <coughs> Excuse me. And they didn't have uh, cell phones. Bobby, would you tell me that water back there? They didn't have cell phones. So he didn't know the exact time of his arrival. So he's, he came in at midnight, probably unannounced. Thank you. Probably unannounced. He's not ready for him, obviously. He has nothing for him to eat. So he goes to his friend's house. A friend of mine just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. He would call out the friend now would call out from his bedroom, don't bother me. It's not convenient. That's not what that says. That's what I'm saying. He's saying. He said, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and we're all in bed. I cannot help you this time. He said, it's midnight, man. My kids are asleep. We're all in bed. We're asleep. It's not convenient. Come back when it's convenient, maybe. But now, no. But I tell you this, though he won't do it as a friend, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and give you what you want so his reputation won't be damaged. If you keep knocking on that door, and the neighbors begin to hear, and they begin to get up and hear what was going on, and they see that they're up, but you're not getting up to help your friend, it, it would hurt his reputation. So he said, if, if you just keep knocking, and if you keep saying, hey, my friend's here, and I need food for him, and I don't have any, that your friend will eventually get up and give you what you asked for. So verse number nine, so do you, uh, even your earthly friends will finally answer if you're persistent. But folks, how much more will your father who loves you answer your request? See, if this is an opposite of God, his friend is saying, don't bother me. It's not convenient. It's a bad time. And I think sometimes a lot of us Christians, we answer people that way. It's not convenient for me right now. No, I can't help you. But, in verse number 9, Jesus went on to say, And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open." quite the opposite of the friend in the parable. The friend in the parable says, don't bother me, and, and Jesus says, keep bothering me. Keep talking to me. It does, I'm not bothered. I, I've got, Jesus says, I've got time always to listen to you. It's always a good time for you to talk to God. With God, it's always a good time. There's never a bad time or a time when he's too busy or distracted. No, there are. there's not a bad time. It's always a good time. So he said, keep talking to me. Then verse number 10 says, for everyone who asks receives. Listen to this verse carefully because I want us to talk about it a little bit. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And the door is open to everyone who knocks. Let me tell you my personal experience and see if you can relate. There have been times when I have prayed and I felt like I did not receive what I asked for. 
Have you ever? Be honest now. You pray for something, it just doesn't happen. There have been times when I have sought answers and didn't feel like I received them. There have been times when I felt like I knocked on the door and it wasn't open. I've had times when I felt that way. Let me tell you why I think we have those times. I think we have those times because when we pray, we tell God what we want and then we tell Him how to accomplish it. Don't we? I'm trying to break myself of that. I am one of, I'm one of His worst children. I am sure. Because usually when I have a desire, I also have a plan. <laughs> and if, if God would just listen to my plan and take my suggestion, then it's all going to work out good for everybody. So we tell, we tell God what we want, then we tell Him how to do it. And then we say, well, He didn't do it the way I told Him to, so He didn't answer my prayer. My prayer wasn't answered. You didn't, we didn't give Him a chance to answer. We told Him what to do and how to do it. When we want God to answer a prayer, we've got to accept His answer in His time in his way but when he doesn't answer the way we told him to then we say he didn't answer my prayer sometimes I feel like my prayers aren't answered Would they? can you just be honest enough to say that you've had times when you felt that way okay here's the deal Chapter 11 of Luke, verse 10 says, For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And the door is open to everyone who knocks. Now let me ask you a question. Are yours and my feelings correct or is the word of God correct? Word of God's correct, isn't it? Our feelings can be very deceiving and very wrong. But God's word is always true. So when you have a time and you think, oh, I feel like my prayer wasn't answered, you go back here to chapter 11, verse 10, and you claim the promise for everyone who asks receives. you know what that means? God answers every single prayer that is put to him. Only we don't recognize the answers because he doesn't always do what we tell him to or ask him to. So we don't recognize the answer. We only answer. We only recognize the answer yes, and that is many times God's answer is yes. But we don't like to hear the answer no. And sometimes God's answer to our prayer is no, but we don't want to hear it. So if He says no, we say, well, He didn't answer my prayer. Yes, He did. And sometimes God says wait. We're not good at that. We don't like it. We don't want it. When I pray a prayer on something I want, to be honest with you, I want it right now. The sooner the better. But sometimes God says, you need to wait. We're not good at that. So we say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Yes, it says everyone who asks receives. That means God answers every single prayer that is prayed. Yes, no, maybe. Or not maybe, wait. <laughs> Don't say maybe. God doesn't work in maybes. <laughs> Ooh, that was bad. Okay, not maybe. It is yes, no, or wait. In time. Wait till the right time. Because everyone who asks, my friend, receives. That means God answers every single prayer that's prayed. Everyone who seeks finds. And the door is open to everyone who knocks. Verse number 11 says, You fathers, you earthly fathers, if your children ask for a fish, will you give them a snake instead? Will you give them a viper? They ask for a fish to be fed. Are you going to give them a snake? Really, are you? You earthly fathers? Shake or nod your head. No. No. 
you are not going to give your child a snake. Verse number 12 says, or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. If you, listen to this, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? God has many gifts and He's gifted all of you. He's given all of you gifts. But you know what God's best gift is? The Holy Spirit is His very best gift. Now turn over to... Uh, Luke chapter 18 and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. It's another parable based on the same principle. So in the book of Luke, Jesus did it at least twice. So when Jesus teaches and when it's recorded that he taught something more than once, don't you think that just maybe we need to pay some real close attention to it? Verse 18, or chapter 18 of the book of Luke, verse number 1 says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to illustrate their need for constant prayer and to show them that they must never give up. Listen, Jesus did this. Why? It said, pay it. Just listen to what he said. Let it seek into your mind and heart. One day Jesus told his disciples of a parable or a story to illustrate what? Their need for constant prayer. You and I have a need for constant, constant prayer. That's what Jesus said. He wanted to illustrate to his disciples how they had a constant need, and we still do today, folks. We have a constant need for prayer. And if you have a constant need for prayer, we need to be praying more. If I were to ask this morning, and please don't raise your hand, I just a rhetorical question. Think back over the last week. All right, you ready? Think back over the past week. Can you remember a prayer that God answered for you? Okay, if you cannot, if you're searching in there, but you're not coming up with anything, I'm going to tell you something about your prayer life. You don't pray very much. If I can't look back and see answered prayer in my life, what that would tell me about myself is I'm not praying enough. Why? Because God answers prayer. He does. And because he answers prayer, we have a constant need, folks, uh, for prayer and to show them that they must never give up. He said, don't grow weary in well-doing. When you're praying for something, folks, we don't pray to change God's mind. He doesn't say, keep on asking, and, I'll, it, and it doesn't even mean, just keep on asking, and I'll finally change my mind and do what you ask me to. No, that is not what he's saying at all. He's not like that earthly. He said he wasn't like that earthly, friend. So we don't keep on praying and knocking to finally get Jesus to see it my way and do it my way. I'll just keep on and he'll, if I just keep on, he'll finally do what I ask him to. That is not what he teaches about himself. He says, keep on asking not to change God's mind, because we're not going to do it, probably. Um, there are some prayers recorded where um, God answered some prayers like that, but there was always a purpose in it. But we, we need to never give up. We need to keep asking. Why? If it's not to change God's mind, then what for? Because it keeps us in tune with God. It keeps us connected with God so that when he answers in a way that wasn't what we were expecting, when his answer wasn't exactly what we thought it would be, we've continued to pray. We're connected to God and we'll, we'll accept his answer because we'll know that it came from him. It's not to get God to agree with us. We keep asking until we agree with God. 
that whatever his answer is, we say hallelujah. Wasn't what I expected, wasn't necessarily what I wanted, what I thought I wanted. But if that's the answer, Lord, I trust you. So we continue to ask so, so that we will agree with God, not to get him to agree with us, and never give up. He said, don't grow weary in well-doing. So just keep on doing good. Just keep on doing good and don't grow weary. Verse number two says, there was a judge in a certain city, uh, he said, who was a godless man with great contempt for everyone. This man is a judge. He's godless. And not only is he godless, he has contempt for mankind. He's not going to be a very good judge, is he? But he's an earthly judge, and that's what we know about him. We know that he was a godless man and that he had great contempt for everyone. And my friends, I think we're living in a, a time right now where it's so commonplace for people to have contempt for other people. You know, you're getting to where you hear people say all the time, I just don't want to be around people. People just drive me crazy. People are crazy. People are stupid. All kinds of bad things about people. Let me tell you something. You need to love what God loves, and I need to love what God loves. And you know what He loves, don't you? God loves people. So we're not allowed to say people are stupid, people drive me crazy, I don't want to be around people. I've had enough stupidity for one day. No. Uh-uh. We need to love And you know, there's been so many examples, bad worldly examples set out there. Don't get on that bandwagon. Love what God loves, and God loves people. So you love people, even when they are unlovely. Some people are harder to love than others, but you love them all. Not just the ones that it's easy for you. Okay, so a widow of that city came to him repeatedly. She just kept coming back and coming back and coming back, appealing for justice against someone who had harmed her. She wanted justice done. Somebody had harmed her. She just wanted justice. The judge ignored her for a while, but eventually she wore him out. And this is what he said to himself. He's not saying this to people. He said this to himself. He said, I fear neither God nor man. I'm, he, he said to, and it says he said to himself. He said, I, I'm not afraid of God. I'm not afraid of man. But this woman's driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. He had no relationship with her. He uh, had no love for her. He had no care for her. He had contempt for her. He was a godless man, but he said, okay, squeaky wheel gets the oil here. I'm going to give you justice because I want you to leave me alone. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this evil judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who plead with him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when I, the Son of Man, returns, how many will I find who have faith? There again, the judge is saying, I'm going to do it because I want you to quit bothering me. I'm going to give you justice. He said to the widow, I'm going to give you justice. Then I don't want to see your face anymore. But what does God say? He said, Oh, yeah, I'll grant justice to my children, but hey, come and talk to me about it. Anytime, all the time, every time, God invites us. This is a, a parable of contrasts. The evil judge says, you're bothering me, you're driving me crazy. And God says, talk to me. Anytime, I want to hear from you. There's all kinds of answers to prayers in heaven, but nobody's praying the prayers to receive them. You have not because you ask not. 
talked to me. And then he ended it with, But when I, the Son of Man, return, how many will I find in that faith? Folks, we are living in an age of watered-down religion. We're living in an age where in many churches, you go Sunday after Sunday, and they hear a message on how to be a better person. Listen, you could go and hear a message on how to be a better person and do everything they tell you to do and be the best person you can be. But if you don't know about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's the message of the church. Oh, they need to tell us what scripture says about being a better person. But it needs to be tied in with the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's the message of the church. But the gospel is falling by the wayside in the day that you and I are living in. Don't let it. The gospel, Jesus died, this is the gospel. Jesus died on the cross. It's called the good news. Jesus died on the cross, was buried. He rose again, and he's coming back for us. That's the message, should be the message of the church. And all of the other things that are taught, which are needful, they fall in line with that. But if the, all the other things are taught and the gospel is left out, then folks, we could, we could work as hard as we want to work to be as good as we can possibly be. But if we don't know Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way. He said, I and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And that message Satan is causing to be watered down in our society and in our world today. Listen, you think about it every day. You, you think about the gospel every day. You think about Jesus and what he did every day. In our personal lives, we have control of that. That we don't go a day that we don't think about our Savior and what he did for us. And we don't pour our hearts out to him knowing that he hears and answers our prayer. And I'm willing to accept whatever answer he gives because I know he's God. And he knows what's best. And whatever answer he gives to my prayer, my friend, that's the answer. And it's good. Everything God does is good. God is good. All the time. You know the rest of it. All the time. God is good. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your precious word and how you have taught us just to come to you, talk to you about everything and anything and everything, that it's never a bad time, my Father, but that you always hear us. You always have time to hear us. And Father, we are grateful for a God who has repeatedly Father, you've told us that you want to be involved in our lives. So I pray that you would help us, each one, to make a decision that we're going to involve you in every part of our lives. And Father, we're grateful for the plan of salvation. We're grateful that Jesus made a way for us to spend eternity in heaven. And we forever praise you and thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.